everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the Jeff Willis Show, where we dive into the stories of entrepreneurs and learn from learn about how they started, whether inspiration or desperation, and also uh, what they learn along the way, and then what they can teach us and you and my listeners and viewers about how they can apply their insights and tips and tactics to your business or your side hustle. So today I have with me Park Howe. Now, Park is not Korean, because that's normally quite a Korean name. And also, uh, we're going to ask him how he got that name. And it's a fascinating story right there. And we're going to be telling a lot more about storytelling uh, today. Uh, because Park is all about what she calls the ABT framework of storytelling. But a little bit more about uh, Park. Um, as a business leader, um, Park um, is a leader in storytelling and he shows you how you can communicate and care, but probably bore because you lead with logic and reason, which I learned too about putting together my first presentation, which is about facts, figures, and I bored people to tears. Um, he's going to show you the audience really wants and the emotional pull of a story. Park, with his three proven narrative framework, shows you how to turn your data into drama, your tech into tales, your facts and figures into fables that connect with the primal limbic brain, sometimes called the reptile brain, where all real decisions are made. So welcome to the show, Park. It's an absolute pleasure. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for having me. So, Park, where did your name come from? Because, as I, as you said to me, it, I don't look Korean, and you don't. So, <laughs> uh, anyway, so can you tell us where the name Park came from? Absolutely. Um, my father, who passed away from Alzheimer's a few years ago, uh, leading up in some of his last days, still had this amazing mental acuity for you know history. And I sat down with him and I asked him, I go, Dad, you know, tell me exactly where my name came from. I kind of knew what it was, but we never had really talked about it. My father grew up in uh, North Dakota, he, uh, a product of the Depression era, so he didn't have much growing up. He went on to college right after World War II. He graduated uh, from University of North Dakota with a civil engineering degree. His first job was with Fargo, North Dakota. His first boss boss was the city engineer by the name of Park Tarbell. He was a Norwegian gentleman, and he went by Park Tarbell. So when I was born, many, many years later, Mr. Tarbell passed away about the same time, and my father gave me his name, and with my mother's blessing, of course. And I asked him, I go, what was it about him you'd make me his namesake? And he said, well, he was my first boss out of college, and he was just able to get things done happily and easily. And so my dad kind of followed that prescription. He was pretty happy Norwegian guy all the way through his long life. And he was a civil engineer building big projects, dams and bridges and tunnels and that kind of thing. And I know where it wasn't always easy for him, he always was looking for what's the simplest, most obvious way to get through a major challenge. And so it was that combination of getting things done happily and easily that guided my father's life and therefore made me the namesake of Park Tarbell. That's awesome because um, your name's got a story. Yeah, it really does, doesn't it? I think all names have a story. I mean, they your do. name, Jeff, came from somewhere, right? Where, yep. where, where, what's the origin of your name? I think the meaning of the name is, and I've never asked my parents why they called me Jeff. I think because it was a shorter version of Jeffrey. Um, <laughs> but I think Jeff means peacemaker. So, uh, and I've tended to, uh, I suppose, be very much like that um, through my entire life. But yeah, I haven't asked a story behind being called Jeff, um, but knowing my mum and dad, I don't think there's much of a story. I think your dad sounds like he was a good storyteller as well. So um, he was. So, Park, what, what was the call to dive into storytelling and narrative to be engaging rather than boring? So where did that come from? Where, where was the inspiration was, and how did that evolve? So let's tell us what was the initial call. And as we say in Joseph Campbell, um, The Hero's Journey, there's the call from the ordinary to the extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So where did your call from ordinary to extraordinary start? 
Well, I can tell you the exact moment I was waking up on September 5th, 2011. And I knew that I had to make a change because I would, had been running my ad agency in Phoenix, Arizona for about 10 years at that time, 15 years at that time, actually. And the work we were doing was no longer as effective as it was before because we were pretty much in the traditional advertising realm. Right. And of course, internet, e-commerce, websites, social media had taken over. And where our brands and our, our clients used to own the influence of mass media, well, Jeff, as you know, the masses had become the media. And I didn't know what the hell to do about right. it. So I, many years before, I started doing some studying on storytelling and whatever. And that's when I found the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell and so forth. I know you're very well aware of it. And I started applying it in our business. Mm -hmm. And it was really effective. And I wasn't exactly sure why. So I did a real deep dive on storytelling, why it works, how it you know works with our limbic reptilian brain, hack through the noise and hook into the hearts of your audiences. And so um, I woke up and said, I don't want to run an ad agency anymore. I want to go out and just consult, teach, coach, and speak on the power of story. Because what had happened, an interesting thing, was our clients who would hire us for, you know, the normal work ad agencies do, started asking me if I could come in and teach their C-suite about story and what I was learning about it, teach their people about it. So I started doing that mm -hmm. and found at my age at that time that I really like the teaching and coaching much better than trying to keep an agency up and running in the digital marketing world. So I looked at my wife and I said, you know, um, I'm going to shut down the agency, not sell it, not doing any of that crazy stuff. And I'm going to pivot, use it as an off ramp in to consulting, teaching, coaching and speaking on the power of story. And God bless her. You know, we've been married 35 years and she's always got my back. She says, go for it. I know you haven't been happy the last few years. Go for it. Now, remember, Jeff, when I did this, I was 55 years old. Mm -hmm. People thought, what the heck? Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you sell your agency? Why don't you just retire, you know, run off into the greener pastures and just not what I'm made of. So I rolled the dice, shut it down. A lot of my income went away and started building a new company around the business of story. And that's what I've been doing now for well, about the past six years um, and just been loving it. So you had an existential crisis. Kind of. I mean, I went to a, a program <laughs> called Landmark out here, and I think they're around the world. And Landmark is a four-day, very, very intensive program with other people. And, you, and they really meant to get your shit together, basically, of being uh, accountable to your decisions. And if you're sad and lonely and depressed and whatever, guess what? That's your problem. No one else's. What's mm -hmm. going on between your ears? Are you willing to have the courage to go and do the things that, you know, the universe is calling you to do? And I had this calling. I said, I'm not happy running this ad agency. I'm lonely at the top running this ad agency. Yep. And do I really have the courage to go and follow this thing? And so I went for it and it's been hard but it's also been a lot of fun and very rewarding along the way. So where did you discover the power of story? I discovered it when our, our middle child, our son Parker, was going to film school at Chapman University in Orange, California. Very, very good film school. In fact, I just saw him. He was out here. He lives in Austin now. He was out here in Phoenix working with um, Axon, which are the makers of Taser. You familiar with the Taser product? Yep. Well, Parker directs all of their virtual reality training, and they do a bunch of you know training for um, the cops. You know, keep them from shooting people and tase them so you don't kill them, and you know we can apprehend them that way. Anyways, he was out, and we were having a little bite to eat on Friday this past week, and he told me that he had just saw a stat that only four percent of people that that apply to get into the Chapman Film School get in. It's the highest uh, ranked film school now in the world. I did not know that. So wow. he, he got a really great education. This is back in 2006 to 2010. And it was there, Jeff, that I first learned about the hero's journey and Joseph Campbell. I said to Parker, I go, send me your books and your recorded lectures when you're done with them, since I'm paying for them, because I would like to learn what are they teaching you to be a competitive storyteller in the most competitive storytelling market in the world. Hollywood. And that's when I came across the hero's journey. I saw the anywhere from 12 to 17 steps of the process and it hit me big time. I'm like, Jesus, this is makes so much sense in business. 
in understanding your audience and your prospect. Where are they on their hero's journey? And how can you be there as their mentor or guide, as the brand, be their mentor or guide to help them get what they want out of life? So that's when I boiled it down to the 10 step story cycle system that's in my book, Brand Bewitchery. And I started, you know, working it, b- the developing brand story strategy for our customers using the, the story cycle system. The very first brand I ever did it for, Adelante Healthcare out here in Arizona, they grew by 600%, Jeff. And Avin Satay Tafoya, the CEO at the time that really guided that um, growth over the course of a decade, told me, she goes, if it wasn't for us getting our brand story straight and then following following that sort of hero's journey of our customers and our doctors and everything else, we wouldn't be where we are today. That's when I really had my aha moment, like, wow, this stuff really works. Why does it work? And that just then inspired me to do an even deeper dive into really understanding how story works on our brain and why it's so important in business to use it. Yeah. So you in our little chat before we leapt on and hit, you know, the big red record button uh, <laughs> because I need a big button because I'm short-sighted. Well, I've got contact lenses, but it's okay. So the reality is that you're going, you started teaching it and it was like 10, 12 steps and going, and then you started to see people's eyes glaze over and start falling asleep at their desk. Um, so that's when you decided to make it much shorter um so how how did that all happen like you know and how did you get it down to three um is tell us a bit about that process because i think it's important that people understand is that you've really got to distill and simplify don't you to be able to get um the essence of what you're explaining through make it 77 steps you're going to lose them in the first sentence um so how did that all happen that distillation (laughs) Well, the way I think about that too, Jeff, is think about Thomas Edison and the light bulb, everything he went through, the complexity to create the light bulb. And then his job was to make it so simple that all you had to do is flick a switch on or off to make that complexity work for you. Kind of what would do a story. And of course, like anything, when you're learning it, you have to dive into the deep end and you have to understand the theory, the mechanics of it how it works and you end up really, you know, start uh, uh, the curse of the expert. You know so much this theory, it's exciting. You're happy to go out and share all this stuff with the world. But the reality is, and I'm sure you see it in your world, Jeff, is business people aren't screenwriters. And actually most of them really don't care about the deep theory associated with Mm -hmm. storytelling. They just say, give me something that is foolproof that I can understand right away and I can practice and work. So I learned that the hard way. I would go in and do these big workshops and keynotes about the hero's journey and how it led to the 10 step story cycle system. And here, let me walk you through these 10 steps. And then you can just apply it to your world. And I honestly started seeing audiences glaze over with the exception of the 3% in the room who were (laughs) complete, you know, Joseph Campbell, uh, you know, aficionados. So they got it. They're like, wow, this is great. But those other 97% were like, huh, what? (laughs) So I kept in my process, kept digging, and I found the five primal elements of a short story, which is really a very, very boiled down hero's journey. And it's an expanded ABT, which I'll get to in just a minute. So the five primal elements, it gives you a time stamp, a location stamp, a central character, action or surprise, something that they went through that makes your business point for you, this aha moment. So I was teaching that now as well. And people could get that a lot better. But even then, Jeff, they were like, you know, I'm not a storyteller. Nobody wants to hear my stories. You know, Um, I had to get them over that reluctance and show them this simple little framework of the five primal elements. But it all really led down then to my, my deep dive into the end. But therefore, the ABT, which I call the Agile Narrative Framework, because we believe it's where all powerful, influential, persuasive business storytelling begins is building on this narrative intuition of the end, but therefore, and real quickly, I learned it from Dr. Randy Olson, who is a Harvard PhD evolutionary biologist. So he right. knows how our brains work to evolve our species. He also is a USC film school grad who 
wrote, directed, and produced three documentaries on climate change and global warming. But now he's written about seven different books teaching scientists and academics how to communicate their big ideas, making the complex simple so their messages land right the first time yes. using the and, but, therefore. I learned about him from him in his second book called Connection back in 2013. But in the business world, the branding world, I'm like, oh, my God, this is gold. And then I said, does it really work? So I started studying and, and researching where has this shown up in our lives? Well, you see the ABT, the end, but therefore everywhere from the very first recorded story of Gilgamesh onto iconic presidential addresses like Lincoln's Gettysburg Address to pop culture. Um, Carly, Ray Sipson, uh, Carly Ray Jepsen's Call Me Maybe, you listen to that song. The chorus is a pure and but therefore. And the biggest thing to me about that with that song is that song has over 1.3 billion views wow. on YouTube. And is it because they use the ABT in the chorus? Maybe. Did they know they were using the ABT? No, they were just intuitive storytellers. They know mm -hmm. the importance of setup problem resolution as quickly as possible. And what I now do is try to teach people, look at you as a homo sapien storytelling monkey, is a, are a complete intuitive storytellers. I just want you to become intentional using these frameworks in your communication so that, as I mentioned earlier, you can hack through the noise and hook into the hearts of your prospects. Cool. Now you mentioned uh, some of the calls, set up, hook, and what was the last part of, what was the next one? Set up problem resolution. Set up problem resolution, okay. So in essence, that's another way of describing your ABT framework. Yeah, the best way to, to think about it is we talk about the three forces of story. So let's dive in a little bit deeper on that set of problem resolution. Great. The let's, ABT let's framework yep. is set up on these three forces, agreement, contradiction, and consequence. Right. This three parent, you know, the development of story has been around since the beginning of time. The idea is you don't lead with the problem as we're often taught, you know, taught in, in yes. business communications. You lead with what is a shared vision that we both want to attain, you know, tomorrow. What what does a brighter look tomorrow look like and why is that important to you, the audience? But you don't currently have it because of this problem. Therefore, imagine what it's going to be like when you do achieve it with us because we're going to help you get over that problem. Right. So it's agreement, contradiction, consequence. And that's what really hacks through into our limbic brain because it's the problem solution dynamic. So tell us through it again, agreement. Agreement, contradiction, consequence. I'll show it to you in action. I was doing a bunch of work with Home Depot and one of their guys one day on a virtual session said, Park, what's the shortest ABT you know? And I go, it's this, you communicate and care. That's my statement of agreement. They nod, yeah, that's why I'm here getting training. You communicate and care, but bore. Yep. Therefore, tell a story. Yes. Set up, you communicate and care. Yes, I do. But you're kind of boring. Uh, why? You know, then you can expand those. Why? Because you're leading with logic and reason when what your audience really wants is the emotional pull of a story. Therefore, connect on a deep primal level with your customers using the end, but therefore, so that you can hack through the noise, hook through the hearts of your customers. So that's where you can take a very small, very basic ABT, it's your singular narrative set up or surrounding the, the problem, in this case, being boring. Um, and then write your ABT and share it where you set up what do they care about, what do they want, but you're boring. Therefore, tell a story and here's how you do it. Right. Set okay. up problem resolution agreement, contradiction, consequence. That Your call to action is in that consequence phase. Right. So maybe give us some examples of, ABT, which is and, but, therefore. And I started reading a book. I've actually about nearly halfway through. Um, I didn't finish it because I got the date wrong on our, on our chat here. So um, I meant to read it fully. But so can you give us some examples of ABT about uh, and, but, therefore? Can you give us some examples and use them to try and get to the essence of what we're talking about today in terms of the power of story. Absolutely. 
Um, let me pull up a presentation here real quick. That's where I've got a whole ton of my um, examples in here. Let me find that. So this is my good friend, Christopher Lockhead, and he is a legendary Silicon Valley marketer, very well known for category design and brand development in the very crowded space of technology. One of my favorite books is Play Bigger. If you have anybody or if you're interested in I how do you really own a category, get his book. It's, it's beautiful for brand positioning. He had me on a show like this, and I shared with him the end, but there are four. He had never heard about it before. And then he started trying it and starting using it. And here's a quote he gave me. Um, and then I'm going to share with you one of his posts, his very first post, the very first tweet using an and but therefore and what happened in the process. So check this out. Here's what he had to say about the ABT. So you gave me a gift with the ABT. You know, in category design, we have this thing called a POV, a point of view. And it is simply structured very similarly to that of the ABT, which is essentially, and this is such a profound insight, it sounds like it's nothing, just like the ABT. It's, it, it's so simple, you can't imagine how profound it is. In a point of view, it goes like this. Nobody buys a solution until they have a <laughs> problem. And so a point of view starts with articulating, framing, naming, and claiming a problem. Well, we can relate to that problem. That then sets up the solution. And when people understand the problem slash opportunity, then they become interested in the solution. And then, of course, the third piece from a POV perspective is how your product or service or your idea for that matter, you might not be actually marketing or selling anything, bridges the gap between the problem slash opportunity and therefore the solution. Okay, so with all that said, why do I love the ABT? The ABT takes the thinking that we did around points of view and does a fantastic legendary double click on it and says, here is a simple, insanely powerful way to write an instant POV. And that's why the and button therefore model is pure genius. It allows you to relate to people. Then it gives them the butt, which tees up the problem. And then the therefore, which points the way to the different future, AKA solution. And so it's pure genius. And it's easily rememberable, rememberable, blah, 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 blah. and if you start to play with it, as I have since you taught it to me, just like anything else, you develop some prowess with it, starts working. You're like, wow, it's almost weird how this works. So then, Jeff, after I shared that on his show, the next day of Friday morning, he took a screenshot of this tweet and sent it to me. He goes, this ABT thing is crazy. <laughs> Read it along with me. Most entrepreneurs would love to design a new category and build a billion dollar business. There's his statement of agreement. It's positive, it's aspirational. You know, it's what they want, but yep. here's the problem. But there's so much startup bullshit on Twitter, it's hard to know who to listen to. The therefore is implied. Therefore meet David Sachs, he knows a few things. And then a link takes you over to his podcast with an interview of David Sachs. But check this out. And he said in under six hours, he had over 60,000 engagements on this one tweet he is a big time social media communicator and he goes i have never seen anything like this before so there's a good example there's an abt at play in something as simple as a tweet and look at the impact it had that's fantastic pretty crazy huh yeah exactly yeah it's uh the art of communication there is so many uh, ways to do it there's there's a lot of truth amongst the noise. Trying to find that truth is sometimes very, very hard to find. Yeah. Um, uh, and recently I discovered uh, a, and I'm interested to see how you think this relates to ABT framework for you. It's like Axios, which was started only in 2018, four years later, it got sold for over half a billion dollars. These are the guys that started out of Politico. I don't know if you've heard of them, but uh, what their approach is, is there's so much noise, you've got to get, you've got to tell a story or tell, communicate much quicker. This is about writing. So it was like, tell me something interesting and then tell me why does that matter and then offer some deeper dive if you really want to get into it. It's a maybe, don't know how it totally rates to ABT, but I just, for me, it was like, 
to why does your story matter? In other words, it's a consequence, I suppose, and what's the solution? But you, you're setting it up. And I think what I love too is about the contradiction thing that you've mentioned before was you've got to create some tension. Now, you've mentioned too in your notes that I read is about the villain. So how does a villain, which is typically part of the Joseph Campbell story arc, um, because in and the Joseph Campbell story arc is revealed in Star Wars. And I have heard that the Joseph Campbell story arc, which you've distilled into the ABT, um, is fascinating because I think the top 10 movies of all time use, use Joseph Campbell's story arc. So that's something primal. He went to the essence of primal storytelling and myths. So tell us a little bit about the role of the villain in what you do and what you teach? Well, like you say, you do have to have tension in a story, otherwise the brain doesn't care. You know, let's do a quick little anatomy. Um, I, I'm not an anatomist, but I play one on your show here. <laughs> our limbic brain is has not basically appreciably changed since our ancestors navigated and survived the savanna. It's a, the basically the same apparatus. You know, our frontal uh, cortex, our executive functioning brain has created, you know, evolved a great deal. But this little reptilian brain where all of our decisions are really being made has not changed. So it's a survival mechanism thing. If you are speaking in non-narrative meaning and, 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 it turns off. It's like, you're boring me. I got to, I got to be scanning the environment just in case I got a fight flight or there's an opportunity here. So when you insert that word, but, which you could argue is the villain of the story, it automatically fires up that limbic brain because it's saying, wow, I better pay attention because Jeff is telling me about something that happened to him that wasn't cool and how he overcame it so that I can learn what I would do in case it ever happens to me. Survival of the being. That's the basic functioning apparatus of the limbic brain. So without a villain, without story tension, you are boring. And if you're trying to sell somebody on anything. Now, you might be selling a product or service, or you're trying to get them to buy into your vision, your mission, your initiative. Yep. You have to shake them out of status quo. Our bodies love status quo. It's safe. I can sit here and watch pop, you know, football and eat popcorn <laughs> and drink beer all day long because this is safe when actual, you know, we know that's not healthy for us. Well, in business, we love status quo because change is scary. What's it going to cost us? Um, are we going to lose productivity? Are, is this the right direction to go? Not. Nah, maybe we should just hang out and do what we've been doing. Without that villain to really underscore what they are up against, I like to think of it as find the hurt, yep. the villain, amplify the pain, demonstrate to them what is going to happen if they do something and if they don't do something, and then heal the wound. Here's the way forward. So without that villain, you've got no story. And another way of thinking about that, without conflict, without contradiction, all you have is a bullet list on brochures. You're boring. You're and, 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 anding your audience to death until you hear that word, but. It advances the narrative. It demonstrates a plot twist. Let me give you an example of it. Have you ever heard uh, Ernest Hemingway's famous shortest story ever told? No, you know that is Jeff. I don't remember. All right. That, no. So legend has it. He was sitting in a pub in Ireland somewhere drinking with his mates and said, I bet I can make you cry in just six words. He bet $10 and presumably won the bet. He, and it led to the shortest story ever told. Here it is. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. Hmm. I have heard so, that, that sentence. What? Yeah. Why do you think the baby shoes were never worn? What's no, the first thing that pops to mind? Baby died. Yeah. Why? Never, why never, would yeah. why why would something as horrific as the baby and final as the baby dying be what you naturally um, you know land on? And by the way, when you share this story in rooms full of people, they for the most time, the most part, will arrive at the same thing. When I do it, sometimes people gasp. Uh, they, you know, they like, like, oh my God, they're shocked. And I ask them why. And they say, well, obviously the baby died, but it doesn't have to be a, a no, dead no. baby. 
Yeah. It could be the mom and dad didn't realize how healthy their baby boy was, went and bought some shoes, brought them back. They didn't remotely fit. They were too small, but they couldn't take them back. So they're going to sell them. There's any number of right. positive outcomes to this, but our brain goes to the most negative one. Why? Because there's finality to it. What Hemingway did is he opened a story loop and built tension, but he never closed that story loop. He then allowed the audience to close the story loop, knowing that the negativity bias in us would automatically say a negative, you know, arrive at the baby died because it's final. Our brain can go, oh, baby's dead. I can move on to something else. If it's a positive outcome, it's too nebulous because there could be a thousand different positive outcomes. The brain goes, nope, nope, I need closure. Baby's dead. I'm moving on. So it goes back to that idea of when you open a story loop and then you insert a villain in there. In this case, we're inserting our own villain, but you don't close that story loop. Your audience is going to finish the story for you. And it won't be the story you intended unless you intentionally open, build tension, and close that story loop for them. In essence, you are spoon feeding them your content in the way the limbic problem solving brain that you know pattern seeking cause and effect decision making brain loves to digest information so let that leads me to ask the next question which i'm curious about and you've mentioned it in passing as we've been chatting and that is uh the five primal um i suppose steps or parts five of primal time. elements of a Ele short story yeah. Let's, let's just do a little dive into that and then let's sum it up. Um, love to hear that. So it comes down to basically being an extended ABT, the five primal elements of a short story. And the idea here is when you're presenting to somebody, you want to go in and you want to own the room, their attention immediately in like under 15 seconds. So you begin your presentation with an ABT because you're going to set the stage. Here's the problem we're solving for. You're you know, landing at a singular narrative that you're going to be talking about, and here's what you know, success might look like. And then what happens, Jeff, is when someone does that, and you go, oh, that's interesting, Park. Do you have an example of it? Whether they articulate it or not, that's what the brain's saying. It's like, oh, yeah, show it to me. So then you launch into a little short story using these five primal elements that makes your business point for you. And this story can be told in under a minute is the idea so within the first 90 seconds of that sales presentation, that meeting with your boss, whatever, you've used two proven frameworks to hack into the limbic brain. So it starts with a timestamp. When did this true story about a real person happen? And when you do that, what you're doing is triggering the temporal mechanism within our limbic brain that says, oh, Something must have happened in this time because Park is starting with a timestamp. The more specific, the better. Last Tuesday morning at 9 a.m., my Depression-era father. People can immediately picture where that you know is uh, or at that time and place. Anywhere that you can start to trigger that limbic brain that says, oh, I better pay attention to learn what I would do in case whatever happened to Park happens to me and I can have the survival of the being. Then you follow up with a location stamp. Remember, I said North Dakota for my father. So, you know, you can picture North Dakota, Depression era, not a pretty picture. But all I'm trying to do now is light up the theater of the mind. So you can throw in one or two, you know, the plains of North Dakota, uh, the cold, freezing winters of North Dakota, Fargo, North, the little city of Fargo, North Dakota, made famous in that movie. You know, I mean, what all I'm doing now is to light up the theater of the mind. So that I can get you picturing it and relating to it, because then you're going to relate that picture to something else in your own life. And then you introduce a central character, one person, not two people, not a team, not a brand, not an organization. It's always about one individual because our brain only cares about one individual. It doesn't care about the masses. Yeah. It can't process that. In this case, the story was about me. So I was the central character, but I did introduce you to my dad and Park Tarbell. They are, you know, um, cast members in this telling the story about how I got my name, you know, and then you have, so you've got me at the center of the story people can relate to, and I'm building trust. Hopefully people go, oh, he's pretty cool. He's kind of like me. Oh, you know, I've got a story like that. Then you get into the action and the surprise. Well, the action is, you know, my dad's first job out of college, 
goes to work for this Norwegian gentleman by the name of Tar Park Tarbell. And the surprise for me was upon my birth, he had passed away. So you've got this little sort of kismet of life going on. And when I asked my dad, when my dad was close to death, why did you name me, you know, after him? Because he got things done easily and happily. And that's the way my dad went through life. And that's what I aspire to do. So that makes my business point for me. Hard worker, get things done easily and happily as I help teach people about storytelling. So that's the short little, now I went on without an explanation a little bit longer than I need to, but I could set up a presentation if I am just trying to build some confidence in my people that I'm selling to or whatever, and I might start with something about, boy, what's in a name, right? <laughs> we all have our names that we try to live to, but often we don't even know what the or origination, uh, origin is of it. And it's so true with our brand story too. In fact, let me tell you about my personal brand story. It actually began in the Depression era in the cold, wintry plains of North Dakota, where my father was born and raised. You can see where I'm going. Yep, with this, that's right? great. Yeah. Then absolutely. I can dial that in, and within 90 seconds, I've used an ABT on you. I've used the five primal elements of a short story, and I've made my business point through a story. Nobody can argue with the true story well told. So, can you sum up with one word what the five um, primal elements are like you mentioned time stamp location scan central character is that that's the first three then you go action, action and surprise action, and then, surprise all uh, in one that's step four yep and then step five is basically that's where i am today and that's why i'm doing this until he, it's where your you're, aha moment where, it's, it's, words, that's where i am today because of these first four steps yeah it's okay. the aha moment jeff that leads to your business point Okay. So you set up the problem solution dynamic in your and, and but therefore of where you're going to take them to sell your idea, your concept, your vision, your way of doing things. Yep. And then you share that little story. And at the very end of that, you want to close that those two story loops, the ABT and your five primal elements, the story of showing them how it all works together. Sure. That so in this case, I'm the world's most industrious storyteller because I live in this get things done happily and easily with my people. So that's, you know, how I would bring that full circle. Then and only then do you start to introduce numbers, charts, graphs, data, that kind of thing. Right. Um, and, and here's why. Jeff, I'll ask you, what is the first syllable in the word number? <laughs> None. <laughs> Everybody has to think about it. It's numb. So our numbers, our data, our charts, graphs mean nothing unless they are placed in the context of a story. So when you use an ABT and the five primal elements, you are setting up that context using storytelling frameworks, you know, agreement, contradiction, consequence, then actually telling an anecdotal story, then the numbers make sense. And what you're doing is you're selling to the emotional limbic brain with the ABT and the five primal elements and then you are leveling up that decision into the frontal cortex, the executive functioning brain, when you now start rolling out your numbers, your data to support the emotional hook that you have created with your people. And I learned this in the most surprising place. As I was on my storytelling journey, my our son Parker, who was at film school, um, we he for Christmas, I got him a ticket to uh, Robert McKee, you know, the legendary screenwriting coach from Hollywood, does this amazing three day course called Story. And so he went as a as a filmmaker. I went as a marketer and we sat there in a room of 300 wannabe uh, filmmakers. And so he was coaching, you know, screenwriters about this. And he said, which really landed in my marketing brain, he said, make no mistake. Our subconscious is, or uh, let me let me start that again. He said, make no mistake, our conscious mind is simply the PR department for our subconscious mind where all of the real decisions are being made. And he said that in relation to writing subtext. You know, when you're saying this and you have your actress's eyes doing that, what is the subtext? You better really be paying attention to that subtext because your audience certainly is going to be. And that's what had a huge impact in my life in storytelling when you're thinking about selling anything. Sell to the heart, the emotional limbic brain, and then the logic-driven reason brain will follow. It will justify the purchase that has already been made 
in that limbic brain. Exactly. So you, so you're teaching this obviously. What are the key ways you get your story out and also train people? What are some of the resources that our listeners and viewers uh, can tap into or contact you about in terms of, um, you know, your ABT, uh, the five primal elements? Where, where can they learn that? I know you've done a couple of books. Maybe tell yep. people about that. So. Tell us where people can really dive into, dive deeper into what you're telling us today. Well, Jeff, like you, I've got a podcast that comes out every Monday with a new story artist from around the world. And I explore stories from every, every possible angle in business, sales, marketing, and organizational communications. Been doing it for over seven years now, and they can find that at Business of Story. It's on, you know, Lisbon, uh, Libsyn uh, feeds it out to yep. Apple Podcasts. Anywhere you can find the show, check it out, Park Howell, uh, Business of Story. You can come on over to my website, businessofstory.com. If you'd like to hear four, I've got really, oops, I've got really two books out. The first one I wrote is the, the Brand Bewitchery, and this is all about the 10-step story cycle system inspired by Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey. Yes. And it will take you through and show you how you can use it for brand story, strategy crafting, and or long form communications, be it a sales presentation or whatever, you can take people on this process. Um, if you wanna learn more about the end, but therefore definitely check out the Narrative Gym for Business, which I co-wrote with my good friend, Dr. Randy Olson. Um, he teaches it in the science academic world. I translate it into the business world and have phenomenal success with it. And I'd like to, since you were so kind to have me on your show, I'd like to make an offer um, for your viewers. I'm going to have a landing page at businessofstory.com um, forward slash, why don't we go JBS, Jeff Bullis Show, right? Okay. JBS. Cool. Yep. You go there, you can get a free copy of this book, a digital download. It's only 75 pages, so it can help walk you through it, help your viewers and listeners start working their and butt there for us. And I've also got a quick online course. It's one hour long, three 20 minute modules by me called the ABTs of Agile Communications. Um, I'll give your viewers 30% off of that. And they go to the landing page, type in the uh, promo code I'll have there for them, and they can get a 30% discount on that course and start using the ABT immediately. Awesome. Thank you very much. Well, people are going to get your book for free. I had to pay for it. So it can do a lot better than me. Uh, Didn't so, I send it to you? <laughs> no, nah, it doesn't matter. No. It wasn't too expensive, I don't think. No, no, no. I'm not complaining. It's just uh, my viewers and readers will get a much, uh, much better offer than I got. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the other thing I'll do for your viewers, uh, listeners, is when you do the course, then email me your ABT. And Jeff, you do the same, and gonna, I will coach you. I'll shoot yeah. you an email back with coaching on where – I think it's solid and where you might be able to tweak it and use it so that they can apply it immediately in all their communication. Okay. So I might, I might lean into you on that on uh, we're just launched, we've launched a uh, premium newsletter, which is about how, how to help teach people provide resources to help them launch this side hustle. Um, and that perfectly leads to, uh, which basically is the reason I leaned into that and doing that today is because I launched jeffbullis.com as a side hustle and it turned into my main hustle and it's changed my life. So ABT on that would be really great to check because um, we want to change people's life to give them freedom um, and design their own life. So that's what we want to do. Well, Jeff, do you want to do a quick ABT right now? Live coaching? You got two minutes? Yep, let's, let's do it. But this will be good for your, uh, your audience as well. Can you say, yep. here's the thinking process through it. So let's do it relative to your new newsletter. Yep. I want to start with who is your number one audience? I know you're probably talking a lot of people, but I want to know that whole Pareto principle. You know, what's the one audience that makes up 80% of your business? I think, who is I think they are successful, but unhappy. Let's go even deeper. Successful, but unhappy. Who, what are they? They're, they're in their forties, maybe in their thirties, forties. They've started a career They're 10, 15 years in, they're going, wasn't supposed to be better than this. Okay. So what is the main problem you're helping them overcome? The happiness factor? Happiness, in other words, and also to feel fulfilled because a lot of people, it's not about the money. 
a lot of us have got more money than we need or got enough money, uh, but we're not fulfilled. Ah, excellent. So let's use that word. Can we use that word as the singular narrative of fulfillment? Nothing in the Jeff Bullis uh, newsletter makes sense except in the light of fulfillment. How yes. can I become more fulfilled? So you might start a statement of agreement out how. You know, I've kind of already said, who's your number one audience? What do they want relative to your offering? And why is that important to them? How would you write that statement of agreement? Uh, I really don't know off the top of my head. Okay. <laughs> I always like to start with the word you being you, the reader, not you, Jeff. I want it to be outside of your realm, the person you're talking to, placing your audience at the center of the story. So you are a successful leader. Mm -hmm. And in, we can use this if then clause that we like to do to bring specificity to it. Um, and if you could find fulfillment and, and, and if you, yeah. And if you could find fulfillment in your career, then you will have off the chart success personally and professionally. Yep. Fair enough. Work. Yep. Exactly. Yep. But you're unhappy mm -hmm. because, because why? Why are they unfulfilled? So they want for fulfillment, but they're obviously not there because they're unhappy. Give me something after that word because I like using the word because in the problem statement because it really specifies it. So you want fulfillment, but you're unhappy because of what? Because you're not doing what you love or good at. Go yeah. even deeper than that. Why yeah. aren't they doing what they love or good at? Because they're afraid of failure, they're afraid of judgment, they are trying to be too perfect. Uh, there's a few few elements. So is it a little bit like now, I, I'm going to be a narcissist here. So is it like me when I turned away from my ad agency after 20 years and yes. people said, why didn't you sell it? And I said, I didn't want to be handcuffed for five years to whoever bought it while I yep. had to still keep building their business and I yep. need to build mine. And they were looking at me like, you're freaking nuts. Why would you do that? You know? And so, but I had the courage to do it because I had a lot of good people around me helping me build up that courage. As In essence, that's what you're talking about here. But you're unhappy because you don't you you have not embraced the courage you need to truly do what you want in life or what the, your calling is. Yes. Okay. Beautiful. But you're unhappy because you have not embraced the courage needed to act, to actually answer the calling in your life. Correct. The true calling in your life. That's right. And because you are afraid, you're afraid of judgment. You're afraid of not getting it right. You are afraid of uh, people laughing at you because you fail. Uh, your peers, your family, they all think you're crazy, just like you were told by yours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I totally get that. But you're unhappy because you have not yet embraced um, your calling in it's, life. Yes. You almost end up with two becauses in there, but I don't want you to do that. But I really like how you're, because you're afraid of what people are going to think about yep. you making a major, major shift to actually answer the right calling in your life. And also on top of that, then they're also, they're in their comfort zone. Starting this new adventure is going to put them way out of their comfort zone. Yeah. Yep. So you have a lot of different narratives going on here, which is totally cool. That's always what happens when we build this. The first one we started on is fulfillment. You want to be fulfilled, but you're unhappy because you're not actually following your totally. calling therefore let's get you on the right track by what by reading the new jeff bolus newsletter yes. that will hold you accountable to what yes. you truly want in life and the courage it takes to get there correct yes okay so that's around fulfillment so you got one abt there something along the lines it feels pretty good it needs some refining we've identified oh, you are a leader and if you are fulfilled then you will have the impact in the life you truly seek but you're currently unhappy because you're not following the proper calling in your life due to a lot of external circumstances. Therefore, find the courage to move ahead in the right direction with the new Jeff Bullis newsletter that will show you how to do da 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 Did you see too, by the way, that I wanna keep parallel construction with that you up top. Mm -hmm. You are a leader that wants fulfillment, but you are currently unhappy because you're not following the, your true calling in life Therefore, imagine the impact you will have when you do follow it by reading the Jeff Bullis newsletter. You didn't come in to the very end 
-hmm. Your offering didn't come into the absolute second half of that therefore statement. And what you've done, and the reason why we do that is you're placing your audience at the center of the story. You are understanding who they are, appreciating what they want and why it's important to them, empathizing with them, why they don't currently have it and the, and the, the, the pain that is in their life, therefore helping them picture what it's going to feel and be like when they actually get it through what you have to offer. <laughs> yep, exactly. Great. You know, fantastic. so often we put that offering right up top, right? We start with that. We haven't even set the stage. We have yep. no reason for being Yep, there. yep. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> then I want you to write three different ABTs. Start with the fulfillment one and then do one around courage. Yep. Courage being your central character in this. And then do one maybe around... Um, Calling? You know, that's, that's, fulfill but, that's fulfillment, sorry. Yeah, fulfillment, courage, and then maybe one that um, is around opportunity. Yes. You've created opportunities your whole life and been handsomely rewarded for it. In other words, because is, you're really yeah. good at what you do, but it's, you know, it's, it's what would be an opposite of opportunity, but your own, you know, your own personal, I'd have to think about that a little bit, but you're going to play back to that thing about being not connected with what their true calling is in life. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. So that's the way, and it makes you really get focused on your audience, what they care about, what they want in relation to what you have to offer, and then share with them. Here's exactly. how you do it. And Again, the last point I want to make for all your viewers and listeners is you can literally use the ABT everywhere. And I say, practice it every day in your emails. You got to write the damn things anyways. Have it stack on top of it. Yep. Shorten them by two thirds. Lead with an ABT. It's got a built-in CTA, a call to action in the therefore statement. And watch what happens with your email response rate and people actually understanding what you're talking about. Use them in social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, wherever, use them to set up your sales presentations, use them to create the new brand story around the new newsletter you're about ready to publish. You can awesome. use it everywhere. Cool. Don't worry, I'm going to, I'm going to do a bit more deeper dive into your resources and I encourage all our residents and viewers to do the same. And uh, thank you very much, Park. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I learned a lot today, which I always do when I chat to some of the smartest tools in the shed. And they're called entrepreneurs and thinkers that uh, have stepped into the unknown without a safety net, knowing that uh, there's maybe an opportunity on the other side to be fulfilled. And uh, that's what you've done. You, you stepped into the unknown and um, yeah, hats off to you for doing that. <laughs> at the age of 55, I stepped into blogging at the age of 51. Um, I was the oldest social media blogger on the planet, I think, at the time. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, <laughs> so you'll be surprised what happens when you create and share with the world. And that's exactly what you've done. And I love the quote by Seth Godin. He said, nothing counts until you share. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what Joseph Campbell used to say, and I love this line. If you find yourself falling, dive. Awesome. So if you find yourself in that hole or in, with your newsletter, if you find that you're unhappy, you're falling already, dive into that, be accountable for it, and then you're going to find your way out to that happiness. Yep. Thank you very much. It's been an insight uh, full of wisdom. And uh, I look forward to maybe seeing you near Sedona in the, in the high plains of uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And... Uh, and maybe sharing a beverage or two or just uh, going for a walk in the Red Hills. So You just let me know when you're out here, Jeff. I would love that. Thanks, Park. It's been an absolute pleasure. My honor. Thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm.